Okay. Great. She is from the University of Vet. Uh, and then she she's a science communicator working with the researchers in all areas of science, technology, engineering, as well as mathematics. She's also the editor of a magazine called Curious.t1. She will tell you more about that. <laughs> um, it's an interesting magazine on the internet. And she's also the winner of the science communication category of this year's NSTF South 32 Awards and an expert in the field of communication scientist information in an understandable way. So if ever you are wondering how the science and communication connect, I'm sure she's the perfect person to tell you that. So if you didn't know, you can still be a communicator in science. So I will leave that to her to explain more about it. But um, that's all that I can tell you about our speaker. And the name of our speaker is Ms. Sharona Patel. Let's give her a round of applause. Hello, that's much better. So, after all our technical problems this morning, we're living in the fourth industrial revolution, but we can't get a PowerPoint to work. <laughs> that's something. Um, but at least these things happen, and that's why we need, I think, more people, uh, more skills, etc. And I, when we talk about kind of fourth industrial revolution, and I know that's kind of the buzzword at the moment, it's really about how humans interact with te technology. Um, how do we make the best use of technology for the benefit of humankind? And for me, that's the, that's the kind of ultimate definition. I know that Klaus Schwab from the World Economic Forum, who, t who started the phrase fourth industrial revolution, has a much lengthier version of what it could or should be. But I believe it's something, um, we're living in an era where we're already interacting with technology. Um, but I think the challenge to all of us is how do we use that technology um, for the benefit of humankind. So I'm Sharona Patel. Um, I work for the University of the Department I'm not a scientist, but I am a social scientist in that I, um, I've done research into science communication itself. So this is a field where I work with researchers, with scientists, with academics, and I help them to make their research accessible. So I'll go through some, some examples and case studies of where I work with people. Um, and uh, th th this is a huge career, particularly in North America, um, in Europe, and the Scandinavian countries. Um, Australia also has a very strong science communication um, community. In South Africa, we do a lot of science awareness. Um, Sabon is a really good example. A lot, lot of science education. But as far as science communication and the study of science communication is concerned, you'll only probably find sort of pockets in Stellenbosch and uh, probably also a little bit at the University of Pretoria, but, but that's about it. So my talk today is um, twofold. The first is to give you just a quick overview of um, why it's important to communicate science. And then secondly, to look at the media in South Africa at the moment, how things are changing from traditional to digital. And then thirdly, to look at how scientists are adapting um, to, to the new changing world. So I'll try to make up for some of the time, but I'd also like it to be an interactive discussion, so I will ask questions as we go along. Um, so let's get on with it. And um, I'll start with why universities are important, why science is important. And I think we often um, don't, don't understand why. So universities, scientists, why do we need them? Why do we need them in society? 
And I think there are probably two or three um, reasons why we do need that. The first is we need to create new knowledge. So there's stuff out there that we don't know. Um, the purpose of universities, the purpose of you guys studying, is to, to ask questions, to be curious, and, and to create that, that new knowledge that we need. And that new knowledge will help us to solve the problems, not just of today, but also of the future. Secondly, universities, um, leadership academies, schools like yourselves, um, need to develop the high-level skills that we need in our society to move our society forward. And I'll give you a concrete example. This is the only boring slide here at the beginning. But it's really to develop those high-level skills that we need to move our economy forward, to move society forward. And thirdly, I think we exist to advance the public good. What would the point be of learning all these things, creating all this new knowledge, when it doesn't actually impact on human beings and make our lives better? So I think those are the three reasons why people would um, study science both at school, but then also at the tertiary level. So here are three examples of how I work with researchers. I've used these case studies just because um, I've worked with them personally, but how people are changing the world. So if you look at the group on your left here, these were a group of doctors. Um, they had a particular problem. They had a, a mother and a child who came to them. The mother was HIV positive. Um, uh, sorry, the, the child was, uh, the, the mother was HIV positive, the child was HIV negative. And the child had a liver problem. Um, and they needed to replace the liver in the child. They couldn't find a liver, another liver, or somebody to donate a liver to this child. Because you need to find a liver, somebody is willing to donate, but you also need a match, a genetic match. And, and they just couldn't find it. And uh, normally, uh, without a liver or a liver that's not functioning properly, you have about 80 to 100 days to, to kind of live. And uh, basically, this child was going to die if she did not receive a, a liver. Um, and so the mum was willing to give part of her liver to, to the child because they, you just need a little part and then it grows in the child. But the mum was HIV positive. And then this gave these doctors, it was an ethical dilemma. So do you take an HIV positive liver, put it into an HIV negative child? You could save the child's life, but it could mean that the child could get HIV. And um, these this team of doctors, they were from different sides. So you've got, um, you've got people who work with, um, who are liver, transplant, uh, liver specialists. You've got people who are surgeons. You've got people who are ethicists. And they all came together. You've got AIDS specialists, blood specialists. And, and they worked out a way on how to transfer a piece of the HIV positive liver into an HIV negative child without transferring the HIV. And so that's something that's new. It is the first in the world. And they saved the child's life. What it means, it also sets a precedent that in future, people who need livers can now take livers from HIV positive people, can be transplanted into HIV negative people uh, without the, the recipient getting, getting HIV. So that, that's kind of a world first. That's what those doctors and surgeons do. But they do it in a surgery or in a surgical theater and nobody knows about it. So they decided that they were gonna go public with it and so they came to my team and said, well, how do we tell the world about it, but in, an, in a sensitive way? It's a very sensitive matter. How do we tell them about it? And secondly, we need more people to donate their organs, even if they're HIV positive now. And so we ran for about two, three years an educational communication campaign. And the number of organ donors has substantially increased, particularly for livers, uh, to the Fitzgerald and Gordon Medical Center. Um, and so this kind of whole campaign about it. But it was important for us to tell the world about it in order for us to, to help others. The second was, um, if you look at uh, Professor Abhavesh Khanna on, on my left hand side, um, he created a new technology called the Smart Spot TV Check. So what he does is, is in, in all over sort of rural South Africa where he would go, they would test people for TV. But they would take the, do the test for TV, send it to a laboratory in an urban city or center, which would take about two weeks or so. And then by the time they got the results back, that person could, if he, if he or she did have TV, could have spread it in that community. And so what he did was developed a, um, a, t, a TV check on, uh, on site. So it's, a, it's just a little, little test which you do, it's a pinprick, and, and you test it on site. That means that you don't need to wait for two weeks for the results to come from the laboratory. Um, he's now developed this technology and it's now available in 50 countries around the world. He came to us 
so that we could, uh, initially when HSC it was in one rural site in Limpopo in South Africa. After we had engaged with them, it's now global, which is the World Health Organization, and basically it's saving billions of lives. But the point is that we had to tell people about it. T people don't like talking about TB, people don't like talking about HIV or AIDS. People find it boring because they hear it all the time. But that's, that's one way of how scientists can change the world and how we can communicate about it. Um, and, and there are a number of others. I won't go through these examples, but the NHI is very topical at the moment. Who knows what the NHI is? It's a national health, health insurance. It's sort of a new medi medical aid type issue for, for the country. Um, it's being introduced, and um, so at Edwards we've got two professors who are, one who's vehemently against the NHI, and another one who thinks that it's the best thing that's going to happen for the country. And then our job is to facilitate the communication. It's for us to say, here's a platform, come and listen to both these scientists talk about why they think it could work or couldn't work, and let the audiences and people make up their own mind. So, so that's another part of what we do, and that's about um, uh, using communication to talk about uh, issues which affect, human, uh, affect humanity, uh, but giving all sides of the story, hearing all sides of it um, based on fact and based on research. And um, if you want any details of how we do it, I'm happy to share that afterwards. Um, we're living in this era of what people call the fourth industrial revolution, and there are complex problems that need to be solved. Right? Technology can go so far. But what are the skills we need for the future? So what's the future of work? So according to some academics, they're saying that in 20 or 30 years or so, you won't need accountants or lawyers. So, I mean, if that, those are choices that you guys have to make in the next two or three years, four years. Um, do you study to become an accountant and then you're replaced by a computer, machine, or robot? Um, and and well, we shouldn't jump to those kind of scary scenarios, I think, all at once here. Because we've had three in, uh, industrial revolutions, we've had different revolutions all the time. So I think some jobs will change, I think some will become redundant, but new jobs will also be created. And we need to think about what those skills are going to be kind of for the future. And so we work with scientists to try to predict what will happen um, in, in the future. Um, you're also going to learn in different classrooms. You're going to learn in smart classrooms now. So there's a few examples here. Um, simulation labs. You know, before people used to cut up cadavers. When you, you know, who wants to be a doctor here? Let's see, any doctor takers? Ah, there we've got one person. Um, so people would go into, um, you know, come and study at our medical schools and want to, and and you have to cut up, you know, people who have who have passed away, and 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 in order for you to study how, you know, what the different parts of the human body. In the old days, they would cut people up. Nowadays, you can use 3D technology, you can use holograms, you can use um, little robots. So we've got a guy here on the, my bottom, at the bottom corner on that side, and, and that's a simulation laboratory. And so we, we use those kinds of communication and educational technologies in, in the classroom nowadays. And then the one last example on this front I'll share with you is um, those three hands, robotic hands you see up there. So we had some students last year and um, they were just there to come up with a third year project in electrical and information engineering. Um, half of them were biomedical engineers, which means it's kind of medicine plus um, engineering together on the one side. And the others were information and electrical engineers and they were more on the computer program, uh, and they were computer programmers as well. And so they said, for people who lost their hands, um, it cost them around 30 to 100,000 rand to have a new prosthetic hand made. Um, and what they did is they then took a 3D printer, they took a, um, a 3D scanner, 3D printer, um, and they, they, they said, well, let's scan in what your hand could be like, what we need. And they printed out prosthetic hands, which were tailor-made for people who needed hands. And those hands are selling for under a thousand grand today. And so that's something you can do. Uh, so biomedical engineering is definitely a career of the future. A career of the present, but a career of the future. Um, another guy, uh, one of the supervisors who do made these 3D hands, uh, connected his brain to the internet. So what he did last year was he was sitting and tweeting. He had a neurogenital disease when he was younger, and he had to drop out of school when he was 14 or 15. His name is uh, Dr. Adam Pantelowitz. So he dropped out of school, and, um, and he thought, gosh, I can't sit at home and not do anything with my life. He couldn't move his limbs, uh, all of that kind of thing. His dad was a doctor, and 
eventually was kind of treated to a certain point where he could sit in a wheelchair and, and, and come to university. But when he was there, one day he was trying to tweet. And who's a Twitter? You know, take so you guys are probably on Instagram, yeah. <laughs> and he was trying to tweet and he said, Gosh, it's taking so long. What if I could just think something and it could appear on my Twitter account? And he said, Well, let's connect the brain to the internet and see if that could work. And he did exactly that. He connected the brain to the internet and they were able to transmit data into the brain and out of the brain and people could think. And again, those are biomedical engineers. Um, another you know, career of the future. So uh, there are some videos on that, and I'm happy to sh send around the links if you want to watch them um, at school, etc. And then universities, obviously, um, scientists and researchers have to have some social impact. Um, those are just some of the examples um, of connecting the brain to the internet and um, the prosthetic hands there. Okay. Again, it's important for scientists to communicate, uh, particularly in a democracy. So, uh, if you knew scientists in the old days, they were all very protective of their work. So, for example, uh, and I'll give you a real life example, we'd have a professor who would go into the field and find a fossil, and they would take that fossil and take it to their laboratories and work on it for 30 years without letting have anyone have access to it. Or if they were studying a part of the heart, they would only focus on that research with their students and wouldn't share that information. But things are changing now. We're living in an open world, open science, open democracy, with open access. And so I think what we're working towards now is um, share the sharing of knowledge, um, using knowledge beneficially. Um, in the past, a lot of the knowledge that was produced was produced in the global north, North America, in Europe, etc. What we're trying to do is reverse that. Um, and that's also because they had a lot, of a lot more funding than people in the south, people in Africa. And we're trying to reverse that um, at this stage. So that's why we need more of you to become scientists so that you can uh, research stuff in Africa, in South Africa, in our own context uh, for the benefit of, of humanity. And then we can export it to the North. Um, uh, so, so we've got scientists on the one hand, and they need to communicate what they do, and research is what they do. On the other hand, you've got the media, and the media is changing. So. Let me ask, how many people here read newspapers? How many people read online? Okay, more people read online. How many people get the information from social media? A good few do. How many people get information about the world from television? Television. Some of three, four maybe. Radio? In the morning, in the car. That's that's a very good point because that's exactly what the research shows. So in South Africa at the moment, print is in decline. So our newspapers are in complete decline. People are not reading newspapers anymore, and I'll show you some experience that's about that. Our radio is remaining stable. Um, the largest radio stations are still those um, that uh, belong to the SABC. So Okozi FM, for example, has about four million listeners or so. Um, commercial stations. Um, I, I mean, there are about four or five, but they, they, I'll show you some of the stats now in a minute. But basically, the state of the media, look, daily, the newspapers are in decline completely. Um, uh, daily is in decline, weekly is the whole lot. Right? So I'm not even going to go into uh, all of those. Um, and that's the data kind of over the last three years. Um, and you can just see, it just it's going down and down. I won't go through all of that just for time today. But radio is remaining is remaining stable, and community radio is picking up significantly. So um, you can see some increase in that. Though so those are the radio stations with the most listeners in the country, uh, and they all belong to the SABC. Um, those are the commercial stations. Um, Gagasi again. These are in thousands, so it's still not that many if you consider a population of over 50 million. Okay, and community stations, as you can see, are picking up. So if you're thinking about future careers, uh, community radio is definitely picking up in the country. There's a fight for spectrum at the moment and a whole bunch of things, but community radio is picking up. Okay. Um, and, and that's also because people want stuff that's tailored now. So uh, I think with social media as well, you want news that you can use. 
um, in the past, it, somebody would sit at the SABC up in those towers and say, I think people need to know these five things in the news today. And you had news editors and you had gatekeepers. And they would decide what, you, they would set your agenda. They would decide, this is what you're going to listen to today. This is what you're going to read today. This is what the news is. And it still works like that on SABC 1, 2, 3, a little bit on e e ETV. But nowadays, people want telemed news. You get your news mostly, you think, from social media and online. So you decide what you want to read. And that's why community radio is also picking up, community newspapers are picking up, because it's tailored to your specific community. Um, so I'm just going to show you more scary, scary steps. So on, on free-to-air TV news, also in decline. So that would be your SABCs, 1s, 2s, and 3s. Um, ETV doing OK, but um, still a decline. Look at that from 2016. 353, uh, 3 million there, down to about 1 million in 2018. So your free to end use is declining because people are reading more and more online. Okay, so internet news is picking up. Those are your internet news channels and your new unique browsers. But remember, TV is also going online. So you can watch your videos on News24, etc. Um, and the way we watch TV is changing. So, I'm sure you who, who watches Netflix, <laughs> Showmax, I think to a little less extent, and Amazon's Prime Video is kind of big, not in South Africa, but I think it will become big. So, I mean, um, I've got a five-year-old, and she, uh, you know, before when we were young, we had SABC 1, 2, and 3, and that was about it. So, we had a five-minute cartoon in the morning, and perhaps two or three children's um, shows in the evening, and that was it with afternoon. Um, the, the mega kids still got to know something about DSTV or subscription or pay TV. But nowadays, from three, four, five year olds are streaming. Uh, YouTube kids, all of that kind of thing. They shouldn't have more than 30 minutes a day, but um, often they become the babysitters. Uh, TV becomes the babysitters. So the way people are interacting with media is changing. And so scientists, now remember you've got scientists who take a whole lifetime to become a specialist in something, which puts them in the 50s, 60s, 70s. Now you need to get scientists to adapt to streaming services, to the internet, online, creative media technologies. And that's been quite a challenge for us, is the age gap. Um, and, and adapt, getting people who are, I would say, over 40, 50, to adapt and to uh, communicate their science by new media technologies. Um, and then what science makes the news? So this was my master's dissertation, um, and I'll skip the first two points. But the third one is that science that features in the media most is environment and the ecology, um, health sciences, so lots of medical news, um, science and technology, zoology, astronomy, energy, anthropology, and archaeology, and then some of the, the other areas. And some areas just don't get covered at all, at all. And I've got a whole thesis on that if anyone's interested. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll skip it. And so scientists now have to adapt to this new world of media. And this is kind of the last, the last bit of my talk. But they, they're looking at alternative means. So um, how do you communicate with the media? So I've got a story to tell. How do I do it? So you can either advertise, so a lot of people are, for example, creating videos, etc., and then they will um, pay for it to be shown by LinkedIn or etc. So they could pay. You could earn it through your traditional public relations. You could um, share it by social media, and you could um, you could use stuff like your own website, etc., to, to share it. And so I think the biggest challenge for me is how do you generate multimedia content? as a scientist, how do you adapt it for multiple audiences and share it across multiple platforms? Okay, and then there are some alternative media models. There's something called The Conversation. Have you heard about that? Um, just, if you, if you Google that, it's theconversation.com. There's an Africa edition. And what they do is they work with scientists. They've got a group of journalists. They got interview scientists. They work with scientists, researchers, academics to tell science stories in, an, in a manner that's easy to understand. They come out daily um, online, so that's uh, and they're on all the social media channels as well. Um, this is just a comparison between traditional media versus social media, and just one stat I'll pull out there. Mel the Mail and Guardian used to cover a lot of science news, lots of science and education news. Their circulation is 25,000. If 
I've got a scientist who wants to tell a story. If I put in an advert in the Merlin Garden, it cost me about 30,000 rand for an advert that's about the size of a chocolate bar. Um, going through social media, you can reach all of those friends, followers, subscribers, kind of in one go. It's, it's free, it, it happens in real time, um, and there's immediate engagement. The, the only problem with that is that it's much more superficial than actually reading an article in the Merlin Guardian. So something in me, and I think it's still old, it means that we need to do both. <laughs> um, in South Africa, social media, we've got about 16 million users on Facebook, 8 million on Twitter, 6 million YouTube, 7 million on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is growing, uh, uh, it was growing slowly, I think it's picked up this year, and Instagram's growing. The three channels that are kind of dying are Pinterest, Snapchat, and WeChat. Okay. Um, in South Africa, we've got internet penetration <coughs> of about 30 million. Um, sorry, a second. Which is not bad uh, for, for Africa compared to some of the other African countries. So, this, um, er, now I'm just going to tell you about some of the new technologies that scientists can use um, to communicate science. Um, so definitely a combination of traditional plus social media. Um, Curiosity, this, um, this is a magazine which I edit. I've got a team of people who kind of work on it. Let me bring that down to you. It's a magazine plus a digizone. You just take one and pass them on. And um, so we do traditional stuff, but it, it's also online. Um, so that's one way of doing it, is doing both the print plus the uh, digizine online. Um, it's also on social media, so all of the stories are there as well. Um, secondly, we use social media, and those are the channels we use. Um, and I'll share this presentation if you like, so you guys can go look it up. We advertise events, and we use lots of multimedia content. So that's just some examples of the, uh, the new media stuff we use. You can obviously track all, all of the who's reading what online. You can see how many users you've got, who reads it, how many impressions they have, how long they spend reading a story, etc. Um, you can look at where your, your readers are from, you, um, and you can compare editions, etc. Okay. Um, you can take your stories online. So you can put them up on YouTube, you can put them up on, um, on a website. Um, I'll send you a link to the Vits YouTube channels. Uh, we can't connect the video here today, but basically there's one, one story. Um, I think it's here. This guy, this guy. Um, there was a guy called Professor Lou Ashwell. So he's an old guy, he's like in his 60s. Right? And if you saw him, he's a very unassuming, quiet scientist who sits in his laboratory and loves doing Science. But he discovered a new continent under Mauritius. And he said, look, I've got to tell somebody about this. And he, almost as a sideline, he walked into our offices and said, I think I found a new continent. How do we tell the world about it? And, and he just, he didn't think, let me tell you. It's a big story. It's a huge one. And um, we, we did a little video. The story was coming out the next day because, you know, we, it must be published in a scientific journal first and then it, it has to, you know, be published after that. In one day, 24 hours, we produced a video um, which was viewed 750,000 times within two or three weeks. Um, and, and that was, I mean, he could have sat there in his office and not told anybody about it. And so we're encouraging more and more people to, to kind of talk about science. But I'll send you these, these links. And basically the one video made him famous kind of around the world. Um, we had another professor, uh, Christopher Henshelwood, down in Ablam, was in the cave. They were excavating, there were archaeologists excavating there. And uh, he had a story published in Nature. And basically they found scratches or art on the wall of the cave. And again, he didn't think this would be a big story. And when we looked so lately, we said, oh, this looks like a hashtag. You know, this could be the world's oldest hashtag. And it, and it was. And, and that was the kind of a catchy headline. Yeah. But it went around the world. And even, I mean, we've got to mention, we were quite shocked on Trevor Noah's show. He thought it was, uh, the hashtag was ugly, though. But anyway. <laughs> um, but it, it got there. And then we can track where our science goes around the world. using something called Uricolert. 
Um, science can be told through cartoons or stories, so this is the 73,000 year old hashtag marking found, and it may be the earliest uh, human drawing. So as much as we're looking at careers of the future, look at uh, what happened hundreds of thousands of years ago and use technology to help you find out what happened hundreds of thousands of years ago. Um, we, for the uh, liver transplant story, um, we used all of that stuff. You can measure, obviously, your Twitter, Facebook engagements, how many people you reached, um, who clicked on it. You can find out, um, are they males, are they females, what time did they look at the stories online, etc. So you get a lot of data from social media. Um, you can tell, I think, uh, this was, uh, yeah, who, who, where they viewed the story, etc. So it just gives you lots of data there. Um, your tweets, so every time you tweet, people are tracking you, remember that? So we can see who's tracked it, who's liked it, who's retweeted it, all of that kind of thing. And then some of the new tech, some of the new trends we're seeing nowadays. Um, live blogs, um, so Professor Lee Berger, um, He's a paleoanthropologist at this. He's discovered hominidae, some of our new fossils, Australopithecus, sediba, etc. And what he said is people want live science. So every time he goes to excavate in a cave now, he's put up cameras there, and you can see how scientists go into the cave, how they're excavating from your desktop. So I'll give you some examples of that. Now, I'll tell you a funny story about him. We, uh, he was excavating at a cave called the Rising Star Cave. It's um, near Star the Starfontaine Caves. Um, probably about 10 or 15 minutes from there. And they found a cave that goes into another cave where they found these old bones. But he was too big to get through the shaft in the cave. So he had to get these, he called them um, kind of underground astronauts. So he, he advertised on Facebook and said, I need eight skinny scientist type people uh, to go down into this cave and to go find these bones and to bring them up for me. And he, he, he tried going in, he got stuck. He literally got stuck. <laughs> And so he said, what do we do next? And so he said, well, let's take a camera, get somebody to go in with a drone. So we sent a drone in, took some camera footage of the cave, and he, he then got somebody also to go with a GoPro to walk into the cave. And he created a 3D app, which you can download now and, and kind of have a look, so that anyone who wants to go into this cave, you don't have to be that skinny to get in now, you can view it um, using 3D technology. Um, all you need is the app and some cardboard 3D glasses. So that's, that's another way of doing things, inter uh, interactive apps. I've given you some examples of 3D scanning and printing and how that works. Uh, podcasts are in at the moment, so we get lots of demand from people wanting um, to listen to podcasts, because I think you all walk around with uh, parts in your ears, etc. Uh, virtual reality, augmented and mixed reality are huge um, at the moment. Um, animation, drones, infographics. So that's the way science communication is, is going. Um, this was an example of the daily life of an explorer, Professor Bergen's um, excavations there. Um, this is the example of the virtual and augmented reality um, in the experience. This is the app plus the 3D glasses. And again, I'll send you the links and the explanations for all of these. Um, infographics are kind of big. Animation. We're seeing lots more animation, particularly in the US and in Europe, where they've got lots of bandwidth and access to bandwidth. Um, to explain science to, stu to students, because people are thinking in cartoons and animated worlds. And so we tried it with a physics project in, in South Africa to try to explain what the black hole was to people. And um, it seems to be successful with first year university students, but we, we're still experimenting with that. Gaming. Who loves gaming? We're finding, um, we're using gaming at first year level now just to explain to people, for example, to our mining engineering students who need to go underground into a mine. That's a little bit dangerous for a first year student. And so we're using gaming um, and virtual reality to try to explain to them um, or to communicate science um, through gaming. And Can, yeah? can I quickly ask yeah. a question of the teacher? Yeah. So do you, are these uh, games that are already been developed by somebody else, or do you develop them? No, so you develop them? we've got the gaming students in uh, digital arts to create. So these four games, for example, are mining games. Um, it was about the ones about the history of um, Johannesburg uh, mining, etc. The other one was actually taking you through a mine. But people had to, so the, the digital arts fourth year students developed it as a project, 
and it's played by the first year students in mining engineering. And they had to navigate their way through, through the game. So the fourth years get marked on the new games that they create um, and, and, and their projects. And the first years get to play it, so they learn something. So that's, that's how they do it. So these four are actually about gold mining in Johannesburg. There were four, um, yeah, four different games that were done in groups of three each. Yeah. So, and, and they're online, so yeah, you can play them online. And then, um, again, uh, this week, there's a couple of things happening. Um, there's a Fako Gezi and Smart City Conference happening. So if anyone's got some time next week, go down to Chimalahong. It's the Vix Innovation Hub. It's in Juta Street. And here you can find all your techno geeks, new Silicon Tower people. They've got uh, the world's first quantum computer. A 3D print of it will be there. They, uh, we've got access to a quantum computer, so there's a whole quantum festival happening next week. Who knows what a quantum computer is? I didn't know until about two weeks ago. <laughs> so apparently, um, in, in the next 10 to 20 years, uh, quantum computing, which is computers that can uh, basically uh, computate um, things to the uh, nth degree, um, unlimited computing uh, prowess, um, and that apparently we all have one of those in 2030. So if they were saying, so somebody explain it to me like this. Um, Quantum, the possibilities of quantum are, so for example, your, your current computers. If you have a coin and you throw the coin up into the air, it can land on heads or tails, right? So that's how computers are made up of binary code, which is ones and zeros. For quantum computing, when you throw a coin up into the air, it spins around before it falls down. And every angle, every angle at which it spins are what the possibilities are. And that combination um, instead of just the ones and zeros, is really how you how you computate quantum computing. So apparently that's the next big thing. Uh, there's an explainer which I can send, but I've also just only heard about it. So I'm trying to explain it. Um, yeah, when I'm, I don't fully understand it at the moment. But um, so apparently quantum computing is the next big thing. There will be a 3D quantum computer on display at Shimonohong this next week. So if anyone's interested, go have a look. Um, and um, basically, um, this talks to universities, but it should be scientists, researchers. They need to adapt to a changing media environment. Um, there are different ways in which people are consuming media nowadays. Uh, there are new creative technologies and platforms. Um, we need to adhere, I think, more and more to open access principles. There's lots of ways to measure and evaluate media and communication nowadays. And basically, it means we just need to adapt to use new media technologies um, and I think the ultimate thing to remember is that it should be for the public good. So I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Thanks, Vin. All right. Thank you very much, Shirona. That was quite uh, informative. I don't know if Khalkhalo, you want to take some questions from our audience. I think we can open for probably five questions yes. before we close. And I've also given you some questionnaires. So if you could just please fill in those questionnaires and then you'll give them to me. I have a small present for you. As you give me the questionnaires, I'll give you your presents. Now is time for questions and answers. Right, uh, I have a mic with me. If you have a question, please just raise up your hand in the mic to you. Are you raising up your hand there? So, Shiron, uh, my only question is that do you think uh, working with uh, the artificial, artificial intelligence when it comes to robots, will we get to a stage whereby we are able to also instill emotions in a robot or other feelings? I'm not a scientist or an expert in any of those areas, but, but I can tell you that, um, I mean, if you look at the, the new robot, that's uh, Sophia, for example, which, which has been created, I think that, that that may be possible. What I don't think would be possible is my own personal experience. Uh, opinion is that how do you get a soul into a robot? How do you create a soul in a robot? Yeah. 
but, but there's a, a legal ethics and governance kind of um, conference happening this next week uh, where there are bioethicists who are asking that very question. Um, uh, somebody, when I asked a professor the other day, he told me we create something called sentient beings. That's what he would call them. Robots that have emotions or feelings. He said we uh, refer to them as sentient beings. And these sentient beings um, would be treated some, somewhat like um, he thinks philosophically. <laughs> Uh, something like, like, like a pet you would have, etc. Whether they can become intelligent enough to, I don't know, overtake humans and all of that, I really cannot answer those questions. I'm sorry. I'll communicate it once they come up with the answers. Um, I don't
revolution and stuff. So what do you think this revolution is going to have because like the impact, like the negative impact because nobody knows? And that's exactly it. I think um, there are lots of unanswered questions. What we what we do know is that climate change and global change are real, and that I mean, you, this week we get stories of what day zero by 2030 for South Africa, etc. But um, I mean, technology can help that. I'm sure. So if we have good te technology that can help our water systems, great. But our natural resources are also limited. So I think it's a balance between looking at what natural resources do we have, what technologies can we use to improve our condition. Um, uh, with every revolution came came with good and bad, and I think there are trade-offs, um, you know, all along. So it advances society, but yes, it, they are also threats. Um, I think, you know, in terms of climate and global change, I think whether there's a revolution or not, that's something that is, is a hugely important, that should be a, actually top of our agenda, our own survival going forward. Um, I mean, if you look at the, the United States and their approach to climate or global change at the moment, um, you know, it's just kind of going in the, the wrong way. <laughs> so, so I think there's a huge, there's huge work and advocacy work to be done from our side, particularly in time of the opportunity, regardless of whether there's a whole thing that's revolution. Yeah. Yeah. So as the teacher, in terms of um, subject choices, uh, to me, listening to what you just said, shouldn't technology be a compulsory subject choice? you know, IT, and um, what does this say about career choices for our, for our goals? Um, sh you know, shouldn't we have a, the STEM school, all of that, that's, that's something we follow, but, but this, this gives me a different perspective of, on all of this. So, based on, on your first question, I think what what are we teaching in schools? So I think a basic education, in fact, I just read a paper yesterday. They introduced coding and robotics from grade out or something like that. The problem is they did that without doing any research or baseline research. So if you read the fourth industrial revolution and Klaus Schwab's thing, it's like, yes, this will all happen, technology, interaction with humans, etc. cetera. But that, that's kind of happening um, already. Our, our problem is that we don't have a baseline in South Africa to say, this is where we are. These are our, work. we need a national plan, and we need that national, so here's South Africa's blueprint. We are great in these four or five areas, so we should start training people from grade R in these particular things. So if, um, there was a guy called, um, Stephen, uh, it was a, a, a Professor Friedman who spoke at the summit, and he said, why not look at your context? So, so China, for example, can produce uh, people, millions and millions and millions of people who are good at coding and robotics, etc. So, and, and they could share and spread the skills across the world using uh, digital technologies. So you don't have to physically be in China to, to, to share your skills with somebody in Canada. But he's saying, look at stuff that's specific to, to South Africa, like, the, like agriculture, like um, the, the mineral resources we've got in the country, and look at how we can exploit those from a, manufac a manufacturing perspective, an industrial perspective. Um, rather than just selling them as raw materials to the, the rest of the world. And he gave some examples of those. So, so definitely, um, um, I think it, technology should be taught in, in schools, but at the same time, I think you need those critical problem-solving skills, which come with, with your maths and your logic and all of that kind of thing. Um, and then also, the, if the ethics and governance and morality is so important, you almost need to teach that at school as well. Um, because, yes, you can have the technical skills, but you also need... Um, the understanding of what you're going to do with them, that responsibility, that social responsibility. So I think that will be just as important. Um, when it comes to career choices, yeah, you we have to think of careers of the future. Um, at, at BITS at the moment, what we're doing is we're seeing a lot of cross and multi and transdisciplinary work because our, our problems going forward are very complex. So they're not seated in, in science only or seated in, um, I don't know, in, in medicine. They, they, they cross faculty, cross disciplinary, and we think, we think that in the future there'll be a lot more of that um, going forward. So even if you do a basic degree in your, in your arts, um, at postgrad we're going to recommend that you do something in arts and science. To do to and and, and if, I'll give you three examples. If you take those gaming things that you did there, digital arts, it's definitely your computer scientists plus your, your programmers, etc your information and electrical engineers, plus your creative people, your artists who produce those games. 
The same with the biomedical engineering. You've got the engineers, but you've got the health sciences people who need to know something about your arteries, your bone structure, and all of that to feed into the engineers. So it's engineering plus, plus biomedical science. And, and so we, we've got, and we've, there's a new one that we've got in data science, for example. So data analytics is huge, I mean, all over the world at the moment. Um, and that's because you've got big data, they'll tell you more about the SKA projects and, and all of that. They've got, so you've got all this data being generated, but how do you analyze it? How do you compute it? How do you store it? How do you make it useful, make that data useful? So data, um, big data analytics is, is, is a huge area. But we're teaching that in the humanities at the moment. So we're saying, look at your population and your demographics for, for Africa. Look at, um, think about Africa in 30 years' time or 50 years' time. You can have a huge population growth, particularly of young people. So you take that, it's huge data sets you're working with. You need to look at the health, you need to look at the, predict the education levels for the region, um, you need to predict uh, what industry is going to do, what the economy is going to do. And, and based on all of that, how do you use that data to inform? should be studying. Um, so I think there are more questions and answers at this stage, but definitely it's something uh, when they do counselling now with, with students, that's something you have to think about. At this stage we only do need from the postgrad level up, but yeah. it will have to come in earlier. Any other question? The floor. No questions, I think. Thank you very much, Sharon. Uh, right, just before you take a seat, here at Sairon we have a, a tradition, and that tradition is the tradition of how do we express our gratitude. <laughs> so so we, 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 have, we have planned something for you to say uh, after giving our public you know, this nice presentation, so informative, even to our learners that have joined us, we just have to say gratitude. So, can you please bring uh, Ms. Shirana's gifts? Thank you very much. This is what Saibode is saying thank you to you, and thank you to all our own uh, learners and the public that have joined us. And like I said earlier on, please keep on uh, supporting these public talks because they are for you. We only put them up there for people to come and give you information. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sharon. Right, without any waste of time, ladies and gentlemen, I think we have come to the end of our program. And there are still some snacks for those who have arrived late, who have joined us late. You still need to can grab something. I think from here, learners, uh, they will go to the center because that was planned, right, for them to take a guided tour. And thank you very much, guys. See you next time when we have planned another talk. Thank you. Woo, thank you so much. Cheers. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very good. So.
Mama. Eshap, na kere kere timini. Nere na kujala sosene. 